Welcome back, everybody. Uh, gonna do our next uh, little slideshow here, dealing with muscle tissue today. Uh, again, trying to work us through the rest of our kind of main tissue types that we talked about at the beginning. So with the epithelium, uh, we've done that in connective tissue. This will be muscle tissue now. And then our last one will be just a little bit of nervous tissue, we'll see. Uh, so muscle tissue, we're going to see, looking at something that's quite a bit different than either of the tissue types we've been looking at so far. Uh, as we kind of look at here, this first show, I'm just going to kind of talk to you about skeletal muscle and what's going on with that. And then in the second uh, discussion of this stuff here, we will take a look at both the cardiac and smooth muscle. Uh, skeletal muscle is going to be setting up a lot of the groundwork, honestly, for understanding what's going on with cardiac muscle. So... In terms of muscle terminology, a lot of times we're going to see a couple main uh, prefixes that will go in there. Uh, sarco is one of these, so we'll talk about sarcomeres and sarcoplasmic reticulum and things like that are a lot of the muscle names we'll see here. Uh, comes from the Greek sarx, which means flesh. Uh, the other prefix you see in a lot of our terms is going to be myo. Uh, this is the Greek for mys, mis, which is muscle. Uh, we're going to see a lot of times when we're talking about muscle cells, uh, especially skeletal muscle cells, we're going to see a lot of times referred to it as a muscle fiber. Uh, we're going to see, especially with skeletal muscle, they are a fusion of a number of kind of muscle precursor cells. And because of that, you get these long cylindrical cells with skeletal muscle. And a lot of times the word muscle cell or muscle fiber kind of tends to get used interchangeably. Uh, we're going to see, again, three main types of muscle that we're going to be talking about this first show, just skeletal muscle. Uh, we're going to see they do have some similarities between these different muscle types and definitely some differences between them. Uh, one of the things not to make the mistake of is a lot of times you'll see them saying striated muscle instead of skeletal muscle on certain people in certain books and slideshows. Uh, these are not interchangeable terms. We're going to see both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are actually striated muscle types. So don't call the skeletal muscle striated muscle. It is a type of muscle that is striated, but so is cardiac. So say skeletal if you mean skeletal, not striated muscle. And this kind of gives you the overview of the different ones here. You can see the skeletal muscle is on the, the top uh, panel here. Uh, you're looking at these long cylindrical multinucleated cells. Uh, I will say on any of these ones, I am only going to have you identifying them in uh, the longitudinal section. So these panels over on the left side where I'm going to get the cursor right now over here. That's the only way I would expect you to actually be able to identify them. It is very difficult to identify them in cross section and it's not something I'm planning on having you do. But you can see the skeletal muscle again, long cylindrical multinucleated cells. We're going to see with cardiac muscle, these are generally single nucleated cells. They are usually branched, but again, also striated, where smooth muscle cells you're going to see are these uh, tapered or spindle-shaped cells with a centralized nucleus, and they are always going to be just a single nucleus. The other thing we do not see on smooth muscle is any of those striations, and we'll get into where the striations come from as we talk about the skeletal muscle today. So where are each of these found? Skeletal muscle, again, pretty obvious. It is found... It's pretty much all the muscles that you think about when you think about making a muscle. The, all the bones of the skeleton that help you do your normal body movements. Uh, the only place we see cardiac muscle is making up part of that heart wall. And we're going to see smooth muscle is a lot of times referred to as visceral muscle. This is going to be really when you think about the lining of the digestive tract. It is going to have layers of smooth muscle throughout it. But a number of your other organs as well are muscular. Things like the gallbladder. Uh, you're going to have smooth muscle in your blood vessel walls in the areas that have it. That will, again, when we get to the circulatory system, we'll look at some, some of those layers. Uh, so you're going to see that's found in a number of different areas. Again, nuclei on skeletal muscle, we're going to have multiple nuclei, generally on the peripheral of the cell. Cardiac muscle, usually one in the center of the cell, similar with smooth muscle. We're going to see the skeletal muscle fibers are definitely the biggest, with the smooth muscle cells being the smallest, cardiac a little bit in the middle there. And again, on both skeletal and cardiac muscle, we will see striations. Uh, we will not see those on the smooth muscle. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this idea of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is just that endoplasmic reticulum that we talked about 
with uh, normal cell structures. Again, it's kind of like the Smurfs. I always kind of say when you start talking about muscle, they put sarco in front of a lot of different things. In terms of sarcoplasmic reticulum, it is going to be a spot in the cell where it would normally be that endoplasmic reticulum. In the case of the muscle, they call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it is storing calcium ions in this case. Uh, we will also talk a little bit about something called T-tubules, which you see present in both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. We do not see those in smooth muscle. Uh, skeletal muscle is one that when we really think about control of, skeletal muscle is the only one that we actually have, normally have conscious control over. Obviously, shivering is kind of an, when you don't have conscious control over that, but Really, for the most part, skeletal muscle is under conscious control. Or when you think about cardiac muscle, you can deep breathe and other things to slow down your heart rate, but you can't sit there and kind of go, okay, I'm going to make my heart rate 70 beats per minute and boom, you do it. We can't do that. Uh, same thing with smooth muscle. You can't control, for example, the gurgling of your stomach or your intestines or when air is moving around inside of you. You don't have control over that. Skeletal muscle tends to be very quick, short acting. Uh, Cardiac muscle also quick, strong contractions where smooth muscle we're going to see is a much slower contraction and relaxation in that. Uh, good blood supply to the skeletal muscle, most extensive to the cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle, again, tends to have a little bit less of that. And we're going to see other features with this muscle. Skeletal muscle tends to be broken down into these little subunits that we'll talk about a little bit called fascicles. Uh, we're going to see cardiac muscle has these specialized structures called intercalated, intercalated discs, which uh, one of the ways we can identify that. And the smooth muscle, you can see a lot of overlap on the cells, which is which we don't see a lot with the other cell types. So at least for this first show, what I want to take you the rest of the way through is skeletal muscle, and then we'll do a short little look at with the slides to show you some of the structures that we're going to talk about right now. So you can see the skeletal muscle here. You can see on the right side here, you can see how it is a long cylindrical fiber. You can see that they're not really branching at all. Uh, these are the nuclei tend to be flat and over to the periphery. The other thing that you can see, and you can see that they are on the periphery when you look at these in the transverse section, you can see that it's not in the center of any of these sections here. Uh, the other thing you'll notice on these ones is all these striations that are traveling across the cells. Uh, we will talk a little bit a little bit later on about how we actually get those striations, and it's something we will see in both skeletal and cardiac muscle. Uh, again, all these cells, why they have the look they do, they all come from these precursor cells called myoblasts. Uh, and what happens, at least with our cardiac, excuse me, with our skeletal muscle, is that these are going to all kind of line up, boom, 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 next to one another, and then they're going to fuse together, which gives us this long cylindrical muscle cell or fiber. And in some cases, we're talking these cells being 10 to 30 centimeters long in some of your longest uh, muscles, things like your sartorius, which would be a hip muscle. Uh, we're going to see lots of mitochondria in these cells here, lots of glycogen granules, uh, the color of the muscle cells comes a little bit from the fact that they have their specialized own form of hemoglobin in them called myoglobin. The other thing that we'll see with uh, skeletal muscle cells, because these are fusions of these muscle precursor cells, skeletal muscle can't, it, it doesn't divide. We have multiple nuclei within the cell. It can do uh, some protein synthesis and other things like that, but what it is not going to do is divide and make new muscle cells. So damage to muscle where if you lost like a piece of your tricep, for instance, you can build up the strength of the fibers that or the cells that were left, but what you can't do is replace them with new ones. Again, lots of pink staining plasma, peripheral nuclei on these. Again, long unbranching fibers here with these striations in them. If you look at uh, overall muscle fiber in cross section you're going to see it is a actually a combination of a number of bundles uh, you can see we actually have connective tissue layers that surround each of these so you have if this was let's say the bicep you have this overall connective tissue that's surrounding the outside if you've ever had a steak it's actually dense irregular connective tissue that's a lot of times what they talk about being a, the grizzle that stuff on the outside that you 
if you accidentally take a bite of it, it's chewy, you can't break it down with your teeth. Uh, that would be this outer part here. It's actually called the epimesium. The word they're gonna see is if you've ever had a steak, you can see how there's a lot of times little hunks of meat in each part. Those are those fascicles, which are these structures right here. Those are also surrounded by some dense regular connective tissue. Uh, again, not quite as thick. And then each little muscle cell or fiber is gonna have that loose areolar connective tissue surrounding that, and that is called the endomesium. Uh, the ones that are around each fascicle right here would be the paramesium, and the epimesium is that structure that's surrounding this. And again, when we start talking about the actual muscle fibers here, those are the true muscle cells, those fusions of multiple cells that become that adult uh, scuttle muscle fiber or cell. And again, I talked about these already, but the epimesium dense regular connective tissue surrounding the entire outside of the muscle. Sometimes if you know somebody who's a hunter, a lot of times they'll talk about that being the silver skin on something. Uh, paramesium, and it's paramesium, not paramecium. That is a protus single-celled animal. Paramesium is that connective tissue that's surrounding each bundle here. And then, like I said, endomesium is mainly that area where connective tissue surrounding each muscle cell. And again, you can see it right here. Again, there is blood supply in here, decent blood supply to skeletal muscle. Uh, again, not as extensive as we'd see in cardiac, but decent blood supply. And again, you can see each of these things that we've talked about here in those connective tissue layers and where they would be at. So each muscle cell, as you kind of look at each of these, each of these muscle fibers, they are going to be made up of, the main thing that is filling them up is these myofibrils. Uh, the other thing they're going to have is this sarcoplasm. And we're all, the other thing we're going to see is this sarcoplasm reticulum, as well as these things called T-tubules. Uh, these myofibrils are going to have the basic contracting units. So if you look on each of these, these myofibrils, which are filling up each muscle cell or fiber, these myofibrils are going to be the two main uh, proteins that end up in here. The, you have your what are called thick and thin filaments that are going to be in these very much repeating pattern over and over again. So you have what are called actin and myosin. So these thin filaments, which this structure that is down at the bottom here is a sarcomere, uh, is showing you kind of the repeating unit of the muscle. So these are the actin filaments. You can see they're going in between the myosin filaments, which are the darker ones right here. Those are the thick filaments. And what's gonna happen is there's little myosin heads on these filaments that can grab onto these actin when the muscle is being told to contract and can pull each of these ends in closer together, therefore shortening the overall muscle. The fact that we have this really consistent pattern over and over again of this dark overlap where there's these thick filaments and then the air where there is no thick filaments, this gives us those light and dark bands. So when you look at a muscle, what you're actually looking at is the alternating A bands and I bands of the muscle that gives you that dark part of the striation, the light part, the dark part, the light part over and over again, and that's where you actually get the striations. And we see this repeating sarcomere pattern in both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, which is what gives them their distinct striations. So like it says here, each skeletal muscle fiber or cell is called a fiber. Each one of those may contain many, many myofibrils. Those myofibrils are going to be what are going to have those distinct sarcomeres and are made up of actin and myosin filaments. Those are the thick and thin filaments that are making up each myofibril, which is making up each muscle cell or fiber. So again, a myofibril is going to have a bunch of these myofilaments, which are the thick and thin filaments. And again, in this repeating pattern of, this is what we call a Z-line, that is the end of the sarcomere. This is the other side of it right here. So from Z-line to Z-line is one sarcomere. And the sarcomere is gonna have these thin filaments, which are the actin filaments, and the thick filaments right here, which are the myosin filaments. When the muscle is being told to contract, it is going to have the myosin heads of these filaments grab onto the actin filaments here and pull those two ends, like I said, in closer together. That is gonna shorten that sarcomere, and if you think about a muscle cell, it's going to have thousands of sarcomeres laid end to end. 
if all those are shortening, the overall muscle is going to get shorter, which is, when you think about a muscle, that is a muscle contraction. And as I've kind of already said this already, but again, each sarcomere is that Z line to Z line. Uh, and again, those myofibrils, so those sarcomeres are, if you're looking at a longitudinal section, a side view of it, those are all stacked one after another. So when you think about them getting shorter, it's going to pull on the two ends of that muscle, which are going to be connected to tendons, which can allow you to contract a muscle. And again, this is showing it a little bit more zoomed in. So you can see there's B1 sarcomere. There's the thick filaments that are making up the A-band where you only have thin filaments. When the muscle contracts, what's gonna happen is this A-band's gonna squeeze in towards this Z-disc on this side and this side right here. And what you'll actually see is that I-band when the muscle's contracting somewhat disappear. And again, this is showing you it zoomed in, again, giving you the idea of how we get those striations. So this is showing you striations in a skeletal muscle. And again, is that alternating A-band I band, A band, I band, A band, I band, A band, I band. And again, showing you as with an electron micrograph. And again, what happens when the muscles contract? These thick filaments are going to pull these thin filaments towards the center, pulling this Z line and this Z line closer together. Kind of like if you look at my elbows right here, if these were pulling the past one another, you can see how my elbows are getting closer together. Uh, that's pretty much what's happening when the muscle is contracting. Again, with histology, I'm trying to not give you too much information, but just enough so you understand why it looks the way it does, because what I don't really want to get into is having you try to memorize the physiology of how muscles contract. Uh, that's not something you really need to have in order to understand what it looks like. This kind of gives you the idea what the A bands and the I bands are to me. I most concerned that you know what the A-bands are, which are where the thick filaments and thin filaments overlap, and that gives you that dark part of the muscle fiber or the dark part of the striation. I am also want you to know what the I-bands are. That's where there's only the thin filaments, where you're getting the light part of the striation. And the Z-lines are going to be in the middle of that I-band, which is kind of defining that Z-line to Z-line is those repeating units, those sarcomeres. To me, those are the structures that I think should be important for you to know in terms of those bands and lines. I'm not so worried that you know what the H band and the M lines are. As I was kind of saying, we do have this sarcoplasmic reticulum that is storing a bunch of calcium. So this would be one of those myofibers right here. You can see this is that sarcoplasmic reticulum that's surrounding this. And you can also see these two tubules that are on the surface that are going down in here. When you excite a muscle, you actually get what's called an action potential or a change in electrical potential that travels over the surface of the sarcolemma or muscle membrane and travels down into here. That change in electrical activity is going to cause a release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and that is going to allow that actin and myosin to interact and do that sliding filament thing that I've been talking about here. Uh, if you don't get the muscle the nerve exciting the muscle, that doesn't happen in the muscle is staying relaxed at that point. So again, those transverse tubules are those invaginations or in pockets or in tubing of that. And again, when you excite this with a nerve at a neuromuscular junction, that action potential is going to travel down the whole cell, down to these T tubules, again, releasing the calcium from here, which lets those actin and myosin fibers interact. And as long as there's ATP present, contract and make that muscle and sarcomere get shorter and therefore get the whole muscle shorter. Uh, I'm not so worried that you know about the triads and that's it. So what I will talk to you on the next show is we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to be seeing with uh, cardiac muscle, how it's similar and how it's different from skeletal muscle. Same thing with smooth muscle. Uh, what I will add on to this one is a little look at the actual digital slide of the skeletal muscle. So I am in again one of the skeletal muscle sides here. You can see this is mainly a longitudinal section. Uh, if you look down near the bottom here, you can see how they're all running kind of this direction. Again, I expect you to be able to kind of take a look at this stuff and be able to identify kind of the striations and what type of muscle it is based on this uh, longitudinal section. 
Again, not going to give you something where you're looking at the ends. Of, I want you to be looking at the fibers like this, not necessarily sliced like that. Uh, like I said, uh, very difficult to identify when you're looking at the, the cross section or transverse section of it. So what I'm going to do here real quick is I'm going to kind of zoom in on some of this. Uh, here's a pretty good example right here. Again, we saw some pictures of this in the slideshow already, but the main thing you can kind of notice here again with skeletal muscle, uh, again, more flattened nuclei. They are going to be more present along the periphery of these fibers. So each one of these would be a muscle fiber or muscle cell. Again, you see multiple nuclei along the side. The other thing that you can notice, and if I zoom in just a little bit more, you can see that they have that banding pattern, that striation pattern. That goes to those A-band, that alternating A-band, I-band that we talked about that is making up the different sarcomeres and them being stacked end-to-end, -end, where we might have thousands of these that are traveling along the whole muscle cell here. Again, as we go in and look at some of the other stuff later on, you're going to notice that, like with cardiac muscle, there would be centralized nuclei in here. You're going to see branches in these ones. The main thing with these ones, long, unbranching, cylindrical fibers, nuclei on the periphery that are more flattened out, and striations that are quite distinct.